This is a good place, this is God's place, this is where your heart belongs. A place of forgiveness, a place for the broken, a place where the healing has begun. So bring all your scars and give them to Jesus, he will wipe away your tears. This is a good place, this is God's place, you can leave your burdens here. Good morning everyone and welcome to Old Liberty. Today we're going to wrap up our study in the book of Philemon. We've been looking at the book of Philemon by its three main characters, the minister, the master, and the man in between. We've looked at the master, the man by the name of Philemon. We've looked at the man in between, the runaway slave Onesimus. And today we're going to look at the minister, the author of the book, the Apostle Paul. I want to look at the study today with the idea that a minister seeks to master his words so that he can become the man in the middle. And our words are important, the way that we use them are important. And I want to talk a little bit about the value of a voice this morning, the value of a voice. And uh, during this time of quarantine, this time of isolation, I've had a lot of opportunity to reflect on and to really be appreciative of the value of a voice, the value of being able to communicate and speak to people. Uh, just about 50 days ago, um, I was in a hospital and had a cancerous tumor removed from my vocal cords. And I had no idea how I was gonna come out of that surgery. I didn't know what the end result was gonna be. And my doctor couldn't give me any real guarantees either. So one of the final things I asked him before we went down to the uh, uh, operating room was, uh, if you find that the cancer is spread, will you be removing my entire voice box? And that, that's how uh, unsettled I was, that's how unsure I was of how things were gonna turn out, of what was gonna happen on the other side. Would I ever be able to speak again? Would I ever have a voice again? Would I ever be able to use words again? And, it, and being able to communicate uh, is really just a blessing. That's something I'm so thankful for that coming out of this, we're able to do this. I thought my recovery time was just going to be sitting in bed, uh, texting my jello orders to the kitchen and uh, uh, just slowly recovering. But the day after my surgery is when coronavirus shut the, uh, the United States down. Uh, so we had to make decisions as a church, what we were going to do, how were we going to communicate, how were we going to get the Word of God out there to our people. And I was able to start writing Bible studies and being able to, to write those things and, and communicate through those words on paper uh, was a blessing and it was a wonderful thing. But when April, uh, uh, when Easter Sunday came around in April, uh, I was not sure if I'd be able to speak. I wasn't sure if I'd even be uh, close to being able to speak, but the Lord allowed me the opportunity to be able to preach on Easter Sunday. And what a blessing that was, how thankful I was for that opportunity to be able to do that. And then we've been able to prepare these videos over the past few weeks, and uh, they've been a struggle. They're difficult for me. I'm preaching right now to an empty room, as I have been over the past few weeks, and there's, there's no life here. It's dead. It's difficult uh, to communicate in that way, and I'm sure it comes across that way sometimes, too. Uh, that I'm just up here talking to myself and, and, and running through my own thoughts. Uh, but to be able to do this and to be able to, to be able to communicate with words, I'm so thankful to have that opportunity and that, that ability to be able to do that. Even though over the past several weeks it's been quite forced, quite monotone, uh, kind of Gregorian chant without the sick beat behind it. You know, it's kind of tough to get through, uh, but the Lord is blessed uh, and we're able to, to be able to share our voice to share our words and, and hopefully be able to help people with words. And that's what the book of Philemon is about, helping people through words. Paul, with his authority as an apostle, with his position as apostle, apostle, could have used his authority to get the job done. He could have just said, Philemon, this is what I want you to do. Just do it. I don't want to have to deal with this problem. But instead of doing that, he used his words to be a help to people. He used his words to be helpful. And Paul's a minister. Paul's a servant. Paul's a helper. And that's what we're all called to be, ministers and servants and helpers. And one of the greatest tools that we have to be a minister, to be a servant, to be a helper, is to use our words to the glory of God. So that's what I want to encourage us to do today. Uh, there's a lot of things in this world that, that we would like to just take by force, that we would just like to fix in somebody else's life just by just ordering them to do it or telling them that they need to, to stop doing it the way that they're doing it. There's things that we want in this life and a lot of times we think uh, just to go go after it with all our, with our full force with whatever authority we have uh, just get in there and get it done 
But Paul shows us, and he gives us a great example in this letter, that that's not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is to choose your words wisely and to use the power of God and the principles of God to communicate clearly uh, what's on your heart, what's on your mind, and what the right thing to do is. So I want us to take a look at how Paul addresses Philemon and tries to communicate uh, to him about Onesimus and about the right thing to do. And the first thing that we see is that Paul begins with prayer. Now, Paul begins with prayer. In verse uh, 1 through 4, he says, uh, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, and our fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and our Kippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. Paul begins this letter by saying, Philemon, I've been praying for you. I've been praying about this situation. I've been praying for wisdom. I've been praying to know what the right thing to do is and what the right thing to write is. Paul was a man of prayer. And that is an important thing for us to note and to remember. He was a man that didn't take his time in prison to lament, but to labor. He didn't take his quarantine time as a time to just shut down and to be overcome by his circumstance, but he fought to be able to overcome the situation, to be on top of the situation, and to be able to labor for, for the Lord in a very difficult situation. And he began with prayer, and prayer should always precede participation. And it should always precede us prying our noses or poking our noses in some place that it doesn't belong. Sometimes the best way to use our voice is just not to say anything, just to shut up and go away. Uh, but Paul saw fit that in this particular situation, it was necessary for him to get involved and to do something to help the situation. But he was in prayer the whole time. Uh, Paul uh, wasn't a reactionary prayer. He was a proactive prayer. He was, he was always praying and always seeking the Lord's face. So when a certain time came up uh, that he was needed, he was ready for the battle. We reflect on uh, a story that we talked about recently about uh, the transfiguration and Jesus and, and Peter and James and John up on top of the mountain and they see Jesus transfigured there and they come off of the mountain and at the base of the mountain there's the disciples and they're trying to cast a demon out of a, a boy that's possessed with a demon there and they're not able to do it and the, the father asked why do your disciples have no power why weren't they able to do that and the disciples asked why why weren't we able to do that why didn't we have any power and Jesus told them that this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting that you need to be prepared for the difficult spiritual times in our life and Paul was that type of guy he was prepared for the difficult spiritual times in his life we see uh, that Paul is a man of prayer he's a man of singing when he's in prison we saw that in the book of of Acts at the in the church of Philippi so Paul was a prayer and for this situation he begins with prayer and that's how we should uh, face difficult situations that, that uh, we have to deal with. When we need to communicate, when we want to reach out to somebody, we want to help somebody with our words, prayer is essential. It's the best thing to do. It should always precede per, uh, participation. We should be people of prayer. We also see that Paul shows his appreciation through positive observations, that he doesn't just jump into the problem, but he begins with some positive observations about the character of Philemon. Now, this isn't just to butter him up and to get him thinking that, oh, Paul really loves me. I'll do anything for him. But Paul is really, truly, genuinely reflecting on the good points of Philemon. And that's an important thing for us to do, to, first of all, show people that we genuinely care about them, that we're not just trying to get our way, that we're not trying to manipulate them or influence them, but that we care. We care for the best thing to happen in their life. So we're going to try to, uh, try to find the, the path to that best thing, whatever it might be. So Paul begins to reflect on the good things about Philemon, his character, his compassion, his love for God, his love for people, how he's a servant, he does all those wonderful things. We need to remember when we're dealing with a difficult thing that every person on this earth is created in the image of God. There is good in everybody. There is good parts to everybody. There is a good place and people's hearts and we need to look for that because a lot of times people just become problems for us we see them as problems but they're not problems they're people and we want to get a hold of their heart and get a hold of of who they are so uh, they're created in the image of god uh every single one of us so there's good in every one of us but we're also every single one of us carry around a sin nature so there is bad in people and they do bad things and they say bad things and they're hurtful and they're wrong and all of those things but we also need to remember we're the same way, that we also are sinners. We also have a sin nature. 
We've been wrong before. We've been on the other end of the letter before. We've been on the other end of the conversation before. We've failed. We've come up short. And at this time, that person's wrong. Maybe we're right. But at other times, we've been wrong and somebody else has been right. We need to remember how that feels. We need to remember that just because you have a problem, just because you're struggling with something, just because you're doing something wrong doesn't make you of less value. So that's what Paul's doing. He's reflecting on the value of Philemon. It's good for Philemon that Philemon sees that Paul really cares about him. It's good for Paul because it gets in his head that, hey, this isn't a bad guy, that everything he does is wrong. This is a good guy that's got this one wrong thing going on in his life, and that's what we're trying to fix. That's what we're trying to adjust. That's what we're trying to help with. He's trying to find. He's trying to focus on God. He's trying to focus on the good in Philemon. So Paul shows appreciation through positive observations. And we see in verse 5, he says, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And we look down to verse 7, for we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. He says, Philemon, you're such a good guy. I appreciate your ministry. I appreciate your work. I appreciate what you're doing. Let me tell you about this, this issue that, that's come up. And I just want to try to talk you through this. I want to I help you with this situation that's come up. So Paul shows his appreciation. We also see that Paul makes his plea. So after bathing the whole thing in prayer, after seeing the positives in Philemon, both for himself to get his mind down straight and for Philemon to understand that Paul cares, now Paul finally begins to make his plea. And Paul doesn't use force. He doesn't use his authority. He doesn't use force. He uses favor, the grace of God, to try to reach Philemon's heart about this situation. It's the same way that God acts with us. He doesn't use force in our lives. He uses favor. He uses grace. He doesn't try to push us or force us to do something. He shows us the right thing to do and then allows us to make the decision on whether we're going to do that or not. Look at verse 8. Paul says, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the age and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I have every right as an apostle and my authority, my boldness. I'm able to say, do this finally. I mean, I can enjoin you. I can force you to do this using my position of authority, but I don't want to do that. I want to beseech you. I'm begging you finally, but I'm begging you to think of the other side of the situation. I beg you to think of this situation through Christ's mind and through Christ's eyes. And he says, being such a one as, the, as Paul the age and, and the uh, prisoner of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm just an old man in prison, Philemon. I'm not going to force you to do anything. If you would, think about this and make a decision. So what does he do? Uh, we look at the parts of this plea that Paul makes. What are the components of this plea that Paul makes towards Philemon? First of all, we see he shows the definite value of Onesimus. He's trying to make sure that Philemon understands that Onesimus is a person and not a piece of property. We see in verse 10, he says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I begotten in my bonds. This isn't just a slave. This isn't just some a piece of property that has run away, that has been taken away from you. This is my son that I've begotten in bonds. When this man came into uh, this prison, I was able to, into, into my presence, I was able to share the gospel with him. His life was changed and our hearts have been knit together, Philemon. He is a man of value. And that raises a question for us. Do we treat people as property? Do we treat people as you have something I want, so I'm going to force you to make this decision. I'm going to hate you if you don't make that decision. And instead of being a person that's complex and it's got problems and it's got issues and trying to work through and talk through and see things from other people's points of view, we just think of them as a thing and we want to change that thing to something else. We need to be careful about the way that we deal with people, not just expecting them to conform to our wants and wishes, but understanding them as people that have their own problems and trying to reach out to them. So he acknowledges the definite value of Onesimus. So here's a man that I, I, I've, uh, I've begotten in my bonds. He says in verse 11, who in time past was to the unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. He says, I know Philemon, you were probably upset, angry when Onesimus left. He became unprofitable to you. He was worthless to you. He was useless because he's run away. But he says, man, he's a different guy now. And he's profitable to me here in prison. And I know if you'll take him back, I know if you'll receive him as a brother, he'll be profitable to you. He'll be a help to you if you receive him back. 
in your home. He says in verse 12, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him. That is mine own bowels. He says, I'm, I'm sending him back, but I'm sending him back and I want you to receive him as my own heart. I want you to embrace him and take him into your life as you would take me into your life, as you would allow me uh, to come into your home. Receive my heart, he says. And in verse 13, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. He said, I would have kept him here as a free man to help me out in prison. But we both agree that the right thing to do is for him to go back and to make things right with you. So he shows the value of Onesimus. He is not property. He's a person trying to get Philemon to think about exactly what this whole situation encompasses. We also see a decision of Philemon's own volition. Paul wants Philemon to make this decision on his own will, on, on his own accord, uh, by his own uh, thought, by his own decision. Uh, as we said, Paul had the authority to say, as a man of God and God saith, uh, do this. But he didn't. He besought him. He, he beseeched him. He begged him to uh, make this decision. So we see in verse 14, he says, But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. He says, I don't want you to do this of necessity. I don't want you to do this because Paul's telling you to do this. I want you to think about it. And I want you to make a decision based on what the right thing to do is. That's important because Paul could force him to change. And that wouldn't cause a change of heart. That would just cause a change of situation. And real change requires choice. It requires a person to understand what the situation is and make a choice from their heart that this is the right thing to do and I'm going to do the right thing. So instead of Paul just forcing a situation upon Philemon, he says, Philemon, I want you to think about it. And by your own choice, by your own volition, I want you to decide what the right thing to do is. We're sending Onesimus back. We know we're taking a great risk in doing that, but I want you to think about it and I want you to make the choice yourself, not of necessity, but willingly. And then he gives an, an encouragement to adopt a different view. Okay, we're sending him back, but as he comes back, I want you to think differently about this man. Using your Christian worldview, using what you've received uh, as the life-changing transformation that you've, had, that you've received in Christ, I want you to view this man in a different way. And uh, before we get into that thought, I want us to think for a moment about this Onesimus, this runaway, and the effect that people have on runaways. That uh, we've all have somebody in our lives uh, that is, he has either turned his heart away from God or, or just never allowed God to enter into his life. And, and they run from God. They run away. Uh, but like Onesimus, there is the opportunity for them to run away and run right into a minister like the Apostle Paul. And like we said, not just pastors, but every Christian is to be a minister. So we should be praying for our runaways, praying for those people that have turned their back on God, those people that uh, refuse to accept Jesus Christ, that God would put a minister in their path. How strange is this that Onesimus fled over a thousand miles uh, from Colossae to Rome and ended up in the presence of the Apostle Paul and ended up getting saved under Paul's ministry. Uh, that is something that every grandma would pray. That is something that every mom and dad would pray would happen to their children, that they would just Find somebody that would just share the message of love with them that Christ gives to us. So with that in mind, not only should we be praying that our runaways should uh, find a minister, but that we should be ministers for runaways. That when individuals have turned their back on God, but they come into our life, maybe they're in the next cubicle at work, maybe they're the next, next desk at school, maybe we bump into them at the grocery market, that we as ministers are able to show them the love of God so that they can turn their life around also. But Paul is trying to get Philemon to change the way that he looks at people. He says uh, there that uh, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. He says maybe this is a good thing, that he was just a slave. He was a piece of property when he left you. But I got to tell you, Philemon, the Onesimus that I know, the Onesimus that I know now, He's a great man. He's a great brother in Christ. So I want you to receive him back, not as a servant, but as a brother. And I believe it's going to be profitable for you. I believe it's going to be a huge help to you. Verse 16, he says, Now not as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Receive him back. Receive him as a brother. It's going to be great. It's going to be uh, wholly, wholly different in an incredible way if you were to do that. Adopt a different view, Philemon. And then we see Paul's demonstrative vow. Now, 
This is incredible because in these next few verses, Paul expresses everything that he is and everything that he's received in Christ in just a few words. Now, this is Paul asking Philemon to do a few things uh, to, to kind of ease through the situation to make it better. Paul's taking the role as the mediator. He's switched now from the minister to the middleman, and he's in between these two individuals. Remember, we talked about last week that Paul and Philemon had a relationship before all of this happened, and then that man in the middle got, got in there, Onesimus, as he ran away. But Paul now switches to the place of the man in the middle, the place of the mediator, and he's going to try to heal this relationship between these two individuals. And watch what he does to do that. He says some incredible things, and these things that he says are really what he has received in Jesus Christ, and now he's trying to offer them to Philemon to help this situation. We see, first of all, intercession. Now, Jesus Christ is our great intercessor. He's our advocate. He stands between us and God, that no man can see God except through Jesus Christ, that there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And he is the, the one uh, through whom we have access unto God. And that's what Paul is asking Philemon to view him as, that he's a mediator, that he is standing there. He says in verse 17, If thou count me therefore as a partner, receive him as myself. He says, hey, we have a relationship. We have a trust. We have a love. Would you receive him back as you would receive myself? And that's what Jesus Christ does for us. As we stand uh, with a great gulf fixed between us and God because he is holy and we are not, Jesus Christ stands there and says, hey, as you have received me, will you receive them? And God uh, has, has allowed Jesus Christ to die on our behalf to pay for that sin debt. And he is the mediator between us too. Uh, that we can have that access to God. If thou count me, therefore, as a partner, receive him as myself. And when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He doesn't see our shortcomings. He doesn't see the wrong things that we've done. He sees the righteousness, the holiness, and the purity of his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is asking Philemon to do. Philemon, receive Onesimus like you would receive me. We also see the doctrine here of imputation. An imputation is a financial term. It means to, to uh, charge something to somebody's account. And you see in verse 18 there, he says, If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. And that's what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, that he took all of our sin and put that on his account and took all of his righteousness and put that on our account. And that transaction was made there on the cross when Jesus Christ died. He paid for everything for us. All of our debt, all of our sin, everything that we've done wrong, he took that on himself. He paid for that himself. And that's what Paul is asking Philemon to do. Hey, if he's wronged you, if he's stolen anything from you, charge me for that. I'm going to pay you back for that. I'm going to cover any expenses that you have in this whole thing. I want to deal with that. I want to take care of that for you. We also see the doctrine of substitution, of one person taking the place of another. And Paul says, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Paul says, I will pay the price that this individual owes. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for every single one of us. That The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, that we all had a death penalty on our life because of our sin. But God commendeth his love towards us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That we had the death penalty on her, our lives, but Jesus Christ stepped in and took the death penalty upon uh, himself. He paid our debt. And that's what Paul's saying. If, if there's anything that's owed, I'm going to pay that. I'm going to take, I'm going to be the substitute for all of the wrong for Onesimus. Whatever he's done wrong, charge it to me and let him go free. What a wonderful story. What a wonderful letter. What a wonderful book this is that we talk about. And we also see a little glimpse of the idea of regeneration back in that verse that we talked about in verse 11, where he says, we're in time past uh, was to the unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. He says that he was unprofitable before, he was useless before, but now he's good for use. He's meat for use. He is profitable. He is useful. There is a different man, a different person that we see here, and that's what the Lord does for us, that we were unprofitable to God because of our separation from him, because of our sin, but once we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are now useful, we're profitable, we're vessels unto honor, and we can be instruments in the master's hand for great things. So that's the letter of Philemon. Uh, we see uh, the value of a voice in this, that Paul could have just charged his way in. He could have forced something, but very tactfully, he used his words to try to help and to try to fix 
a situation. And he determined the virtue uh, in advance of uh, Philemon. He knew how Philemon was going to react. And we see uh, verse 20, he says, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Paul says, I know how you're going to react to this. I know what you're going to do. You're going to do more than I even ask you to do uh, because I'm that confident in your virtue and in, in, in what you believe. So voices are precious. We have the ability to build up or to tear down. We have the ability to uh, force what we want or we have the ability to use character and restraint and compassion to reach people's hearts and to allow them to make a choice that will have a lasting impact and a lasting effect. Vo voices are precious whether our words flow from our pens or from our lips. We need to choose them wisely. We need to allow ourselves to be ministers with our words and a minister masters his words so that he can become the man in between so that he can help to fix problems and to make things right god has given you an incredible ministry an incredible ability to choose your words wisely to use them for his glory and i encourage you to do that today thank you for being with us today i hope you're well we're praying for you and we can't wait to see you real soon thank you god bless you god's places is where your heart belongs a place of forgiveness, a place for the broken, a place where the healing has begun. So bring all your scars and give them to Jesus. He will wipe away your tears. This is a good place. This is God's place. You can leave your burden.